James was supposed to be here to speak, but I, has anybody seen him? Jenny, did you leave him somewhere? Where did you? I'm not sure exactly I'm, where he is. Jeff, Jeff I'm here. You're I'm here. here. Just, just, I'm almost there. Give You're almost there? Okay. Give uh, me a sec. We'll, we'll stall. Did you hear the one about... The, the, no, I don't tell that one. So. I'm coming. Wait, I'm oh, here. There Man, he is. Just give me a sec. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm late. Sorry, I'm late. Sorry, I'm late. It's okay. Everything's good. Sorry. Hi. You're good? I, I'm really sorry. I'm late. It, ran into some traffic, did you? Yeah, you know, I've just been so worried about this message. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I haven't really been clean, thinking clearly, clearly, but I'm okay. okay. I'm good. All right. I'm here. All, All right. right. Thanks. James Allen. I got to tell you, I've been so worried about this message. I haven't been thinking clearly at all. Last night, I forgot to get gas. So this morning, I wake up, go out to the car. So I had to take the golf cart. And I'll tell you, people, they're just, I don't know, people are angry. You know, I mean, honking and screaming. You'd think that they'd never seen a golf cart on the highway before. <laughs> just, been, just been so worried, not thinking very clearly, driving golf cart, and everybody's honking, I'm getting angry and trying to be here on time. And so distracted, I miss my exit. Get off the highway and... I go and ask this guy for directions, and he ends up sending me the wrong way, so I end up lost. And then I'm running late, so I, I decide I'd take a little shortcut and doing a little driving on the sidewalk, and woo, 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 woo. I get pulled over. Tried using my badge. He was not impressed. Jeff, not impressed at all. I was so flustered, pulling in the parking lot, I get in a fender bender. I've been so worried. But fortunately, everything's okay, because as I was driving down the back hallway, I ran into the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit reminded me of some things and has given me some peace. So if you're new with us today, as Jeff said, my name is James. I'm one of the leaders. I'm an intern here at Life Coast Church, and I am just stoked you're here couldn't be happier that you're here, and I couldn't be happier that I get to share God's word with you today. Um, we've been in the series, today's day number three, and we're in the series, and it's called Shift. And the whole, the whole point of the series is to get you closer to God, to get you closer to Jesus. And our, our job is to bring you some tools and some techniques and some teachings to draw you closer to Jesus. Things shift. That's the nature of things. They shift. They evolve. They transform. They transfigure. Things shift. Some things for good. Some things for worse. For example, you may have noticed most of my facial hair shifted off my face this week. And something that I'm coming to grips with is there was a reason why it's been 11 years I was hiding stuff underneath that. I've got some scars, and I'm pretty sure the bigger my beard, the smaller my nose looks. And so some shifts are bad, some bad shift. But there are tons of examples of shifts that are good. Who's noticed the shift in food and nutrition, the shift towards healthier options, towards more natural and more organic and processed foods? Amen, right? That's some good shift right there. What about music? Who remembers Ozzy Osbourne? All right. When I was in high school, Ozzy Osbourne was seen as Satan's minion. But... Is God is my witness, two weeks ago, I'm on Facebook, and I see a video of a middle school xylophone band playing Crazy Train. <laughs> now, that's some crazy shift right there. <laughs> what about fashion? What about fitness? Any shifting going on in fashion or fitness? What about fitness fashion? Who remembers tube socks? What about those teeny, weeny little Richard Simmons shorts? <laughs> Leg warmers? What about those leotards with the thing up? 
that that's some funny shift right there. I know my church experiences have shifted. My church experiences have shifted. In my experience, jeans and sneakers are in, and ties and Easter bonnets are out. In my church experiences, tattoos and piercings are in, and stained glass and incense are out. Think about it. You wouldn't have seen ink and piercings or women or youth pastors at the pulpit 50 years ago. And in fact, if we're being totally honest and transparent, you wouldn't have seen ink and piercings and women or youth pastors at the pulpit in a lot of churches today. But thankfully, pastors Mike, pastors Jeff, they believe in shifting closer to Jesus and not shifting closer to religion. Amen? Amen. Amen. Life Coast has shifted and is committed to shifting even more. And my question to you today, my first question to you today is, are you committed to shifting closer to Jesus? Are you committed to shifting closer to Jesus? Because there are still definitely a lot of things that need shifting. In the first week, Pastor Mike talked in his message, um, the present soakers and power invokers. He talked about that we need, in order to get out of first gear, that we need to tap into the power that is in each of us through Christ Jesus. And last week, Jeff, in his message, Identity Check, he taught us that our identity lies in Christ and that the Bible isn't a list of don'ts, it's a gift of do's. Not a list of don'ts, it's a gift of do's. Plenty of things, plenty of things still need shifting. And I want to talk about something that needs shifting. I want to talk about something that can so affect our vision that we drive off course. It can so distract us that we, lo- that we end up lost or wrecked on the road of life. I want to talk about worry. Now, I know I'm not the best artist, but when I wrote it, I kind of really wanted to demonstrate the instability and the irregularity, and the irritability that worry can invoke. Worry. Worry is defined as a state of anxiety and uncertainty over actual or potential problems. Another source says to torment oneself with or suffer from disturbing thoughts. And a third source says mental distress or agitation resulting from concern, usually for something impending, or anticipated worry. A smooth ride can quickly be made rough because we no longer see our path, the warning signs, or the guardrails that are meant to keep us on the straight and narrow path to Jesus. Worry forces us to slam on our brakes, squeal our tires, and grind our gears. Jesus addresses it like this. He says, be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighed down with gluttony, drunkenness, and the worries of this life, or that day will come on you suddenly like a trap. If worry is the filter through which you see the world, then depression, anxiety, and fear, isolation, shame, and guilt, bitterness, skepticism, and a whole onslaught of the enemy's attacks will set in like a trap. Worry, it starts so innocuously, doesn't it? Uh, Many of you know in 2007 I had cancer. And for a really long time after that, worry plagued me. Every lump and bump, ache and pain would throw me into a frenzy. I would worry about, am I going to get sick again? I worried about, oh gosh, if I, if I get sick again, how am I going to pay for the treatment? How long is the treatment going to be? Is it, how, am I going to lose my hair? I worried about a problem that I didn't even have. I lost sleep over an event that hadn't even occurred. My relationship struggled. Many of you also have heard our testimony. The first time I went through cancer, 
we didn't deal with it so well. Worry can start as a mustard seed, and it can grow to mountain-sized proportions like that. Anybody else agree, or is it just me? Ah, I see some hands go up. That helps me. What do we worry about, Life Coast? What do we worry about? Sean, where's my buddy Sean Guy? Sean, what do you worry about? Public speaking. Well, do me, you want to come on up and, you know, stand next to me and we can talk about it? Let's share. Come on up. Rob, Rob Humphreys, what do you worry about? Your health. You're in probably very fine company. I'm pretty sure there's somebody else in this room that worries about their health. My brother, Brian, what do you worry about? Some crazy shift. He's going to be up here in a couple of weeks doing this. In fact, though, you know, you know what? Have some peace. Sean Guy decided he's going to volunteer. He'd be more than happy to do it. Where's a youth? Derek, where are you at? What do you worry about? School, education, grades, exams, tests, quizzes. What are we going to be when we grow up? Last week before service, I walked around and I asked people, what do you worry about? Talked to a couple different people who said, don't you dare call on me. But Anaya, she said that she worried about her parents in Haiti. We worry about relationships. We worry about our brothers and our sisters and our mothers and our children, boyfriends and girlfriends. I asked Gail, I said, Gail, what do you worry about? And she said, I worry about making sure that my bills get paid. We worry about money. We worry about our careers. We worry about getting promoted. We worry about getting demoted. We worry about our bosses. Worry is real. Worry can turn our travels into turmoil. But do we know that God doesn't want us in a state of worry? God doesn't want us driving around the highways of our lives, blurred and obscured, lost and lonely, warped and wrecked. I've named today's message, Shift, from grinding gears to cruise control. From grinding gears to cruise control. And if you're taking notes, that's the first set of blanks. From grinding gears to cruise control. If you don't have today's notes and you'd like some, go ahead, do me a favor, raise your right hand. Raise your right hand, and Hammer and Sean will be more than happy to bring you a copy of today's notes. If you need a Bible, because we're going to be looking at the Bible to help us fill in the blanks, do me a favor, raise your left hand, wave it like this. If you need a pencil, I need you to put both hands up. If you need a Bible, a pencil, and a Bible, you're going to have to stand up on one leg, rub your head, cluck like a chicken, because you are not prepared for class today. And we're not allowed to throw rocks at you anymore, so we're just going to embarrass you. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up to the Gospel of Luke. Do me a favor, take your notes, put it into chapter 21 of Luke's Gospel, and set it down, because I want to give you just a little bit of context as to Luke chapter 21. Now, I chose Luke and this chapter, I could have chosen the exact same thing that was recorded in Matthew 24. Almost word for word, the exact same discourse. You could also see the exact same thing in Mark chapter 13. But I chose Luke. And the reason why I chose Luke was, many of you may or may not be aware of the fact that um, each one of the Gospels had a particular audience. Matthew's Gospel was um, written primarily to Jewish people. Mark's gospel primarily to Romans. Uh, John's was to Greeks. And Luke's was generally to Gentiles or to folks who knew nothing about Jewish customs. They knew nothing about the Old Testament. They didn't know anything about Moses or Abraham or the covenants. They just were unfamiliar with Jewish traditions. And that's traditionally when we think of Luke's gospel, who he's writing to or Gentiles. But here's a fact that may not everybody might know, is that Luke's gospel was written particularly, specifically for one guy. The guy's name was Theophilus, and Theophilus, it's widely accepted, was part of the Roman government, possibly a governor. It's widely accepted that Theophilus was uh, an extremely wealthy and a very educated guy. 
it's widely assumed that Theophilus was most likely a Gentile, not knowing much of Jewish custom. We don't really know what he believed or what he didn't believe, but he commissioned Luke. He paid Luke to go and do a bunch of research. He says, look, I've heard about this Jesus. I need you to do me a favor. I want you to go, and I want you to do some interviews. I want you to talk to this guy that he raised from the dead. I want you to talk to this dude that he was blind, and now he sees. I want you to follow the first set of followers. I want you to find out for me who this guy was, what he said, what he did, where he went. Give it to me. Get it all. And so he commissioned Luke to go and do this homework, and that's what Luke's gospel is, is it's a letter, it's a, it's a document that he prepared for Theophilus. And if you want to see the sequel, that's the book of Acts. Luke wrote both of those. And I believe, why did Theophilus commission Luke to do this? And why are we looking at Luke's gospel today? I believe Theophilus was worried. I believe he was worried because he didn't know Jesus. He didn't know him figuratively. He didn't know him literally. And we darn sure know that he didn't know him spiritually. And I think he was worried. I think he heard about this Jesus, wasn't quite sure if he was real or not, but he figured he better find out. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you've walked through our doors today and you're not quite sure. You've heard about this Jesus guy. You're not really sure he's God. You're not really sure he's real. And so you figure, you know what? I better find out. I know all these people, and they've got this peace in their life, and they've got, they've got all this joy, and you know what? They're talking about Jesus. Maybe I should go and find out for myself, and maybe that's you. Well, we couldn't be happier that you're here with us today. You've come to the right place. And together, we're going to be looking into Jesus' life, into Jesus' words, to fill in some blanks on our fill-in-the-blanks today and answer this question. How do we shift from grinding our gears to cruise control? How do we go from worry to peace? How do we go from worry to peace? And that's our second fill-in-the-blank if you're taking notes. Now, if today's message were being taught by Mike or Jeff or another scholarly theologian, they might do what is known as an exegesis of chapter 21. An exegesis is it's a critical analysis, a line by line, carefully done, usually done in the original text or the original Greek in the New Testament's case, with heavy emphasis on context and Old Testament prophecy and eschatological implications. That's what I'm saying. But you're stuck with me today. You're not going to get that. Okay? Instead of an exegesis, what I'm going to do is an extra Jesus. Because an extra Jesus... We're just going to be focusing on just a little more Jesus. What that means is I'm going to be going in and out. I'm going to go from the front to the back, to the back to the front. I'm going to pull one out. I'm going to skip a couple, and I'm going to repeat a bunch of them a number of times. But my intent is is at the very end of this journey that we've got some real-life application for when worry comes across your roadway. Amen? Would you join me in prayer? Good morning, God. We thank you. We thank you so much for your son. We thank you so much for your words that you've preserved for thousands of years. Father, we would ask that your spirit dwell here, that your spirit would open our eyes, open our ears, soften our hearts for the lesson that you have prepared for us thousands of years ago through your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. So do me a favor. Read along with me on the screen as I extract a couple of verses from chapter 21 for us to navigate. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places, and fearful, fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. 
They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison, and you'll be brought before kings and governors. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. There will be great distress in the land and wrath against this people. They will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all nations. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. (laughs) Now, Now there's some stuff to worry about. That's some stuff, right? Jesus is talking to his disciples about some events, some of which would take place very soon and some of which would take place in the future. He mentions wars, natural disasters, health issues, relationship issues. He unpacks a list that may not be that different from the list that you have today. In this chapter, Jesus is talking to his disciples about the troubles, the trials, and the tribulations that they were going to have, many as the result of following him, but many because they were, as we are, living in a fallen and broken world. I'm sure there's somebody here today who's worried about something. I'm sure someone here feels fearful, distressed, anguished, terrorized, and weighed down. But the answer to how to shift from worry to peace is simple. It's simple. And you've all heard it before. You ready? Shift seats. Shift seats. You know, give Jesus the wheel. Snarky, quirky little Christians with their clever cliches. If you're thinking, what does that even mean? How do you do that? Switch seats. Shift seats. Sounds so simple. Ta-da! No more worry. That's it. There you go. There's your message for today. I'm going to lead us in a quick chorus of Hakuna Matata. I'll pray. We'll go to lunch. Cracker Barrel. What does that mean? You've heard it before. Just give Jesus the wheel. If you're thinking that, I've got good news for you today. The good news is that it doesn't matter whether we're talking about issues, events, or circumstances from 2,000 years ago, or whether we're talking about issues, events, and situations from today. Jesus has provided us and the disciples with five steps for shifting seats. He clearly tells us how to shift from worry to peace, from a life that feels like we're grinding our gears to a life that feels like we are riding on cruise control. Step one is found in verse 19. Read it with me. It says, stand firm and you will win life. Stand firm and you will win life. This is my favorite verse in the whole chapter. He says, stand firm and you will win life. Let me ask you a question. What's the first thing you do when you get in the car? Ah, thank you. You put on your seatbelt. You put on your safety belt. You put on that thing that saves your life in an accident. Jesus is saying to his disciples and to us, put on that thing that saves our life when times are tough, when the road is rough. He's saying, secure your safety. Secure your seatbelt. He's saying, put on your faith. Stand firm in your faith, your faith in Jesus, your faith that he lived and died for us, that his death granted us access to the Father, our faith that he rose after three days 
that he ascended into heaven, that he's seated at the right hand of the Father, and that he's coming back again. Your faith. Stand firm in your faith. Jesus is telling them and us to put on our faith safety belt and stand firm in it, and we will win life. Understand this. A one life is not a life characterized by worry, fear, or depression. A one life is a life characterized by peace, and joy, and patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, all the fruit. You're taking notes, fill this in and you're filling the blanks. The first step in shifting from grinding our gears to cruise control is to secure our safety by standing firm in our faith. The first step is to secure our safety and to stand firm in our faith. Now, understand, standing firm isn't this willy-nilly, blown by the wind, hide in the corner kind of faith. It's a stand firm in the face of trials and tribulations. When I dug deeper into this verse, in the Greek, the word that Jesus used, hoop omene, hoop omene, is more closely translated endurance. In fact, the English Standard Version translates this verse, verse 19, this way. It's by your endurance you will gain your lives. Now I want you to grab a hold of this. Jesus isn't saying, um, hold on a minute. He's saying, don't ever let go. Never let go. He isn't also saying, stand firm and you'll never have issues. He's not saying, uh, stand firm and you'll never have accidents. He's not saying that. But what he's saying is that if we stand firm, then we can have peace despite our issues, events, and situations. We can have peace during our issues, events, and accidents. Faith is our seatbelt that protects us. We need to put it on each day. It starts as soon as we open our eyes and put our feet on the pavement. Secure your safety, life's coast. Stand firm in your faith with endurance. Step two. The second step for shifting from worry to peace is found in verses 7 through 9, which say, Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And, And what will be the sign that they're about to take place? He replied, watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. You can almost hear the worry in their voices. When is it going to happen? When? I love it. He doesn't even answer their question. He says, watch out that you're not deceived. Another translation says, see that you're not misled. He's basically cautioning them from following the wrong teachers. He's cautioning them from getting directions from the wrong person because that's going to just leave you lost. Standing firm secures our safety, but Jesus is pointing out that there are things we can do to assist us in standing firm that can assist us in our endurance. Does anybody remember taking driver's ed in high school? I took driver's ed in high school, and I remember the first day that we got to leave the classroom, we got to go to the cars, and I was all excited. I thought we were going to be driving, but we spent three hours doing a vehicle inspection. We had to do an equipment examination. We checked the air pressure and the wiper blades. We checked, you know, the fluids. We checked all the gauges, all the switches. We examined everything. The instructor, he assured us that examining the equipment would assist us in the safe operation of the vehicle. Jesus is doing the same thing. He warns his disciples about false teachers and false prophets. He, he's basically saying, watch out and see what you're being exposed to. We too must watch out and see what people, places, and things are blurring our vision to the road we want to travel. We need to also conduct an examination. We need to do an examination of our environments. Environment is defined as the surroundings or conditions in which a person lives or operates. That's another one of our fill-in-the-blanks, church. We need to examine everyone we encounter, events that we endeavor, and experiences that we entertain. Everyone events, and experiences. We examine the people, places, and things in our life 
so that we're not deceived or misled and end up exiting the expressway and end up in dizzy land instead of Jesusville. I like that one. That was fun. Somebody here might be feeling like they are lost in downtown dizzy land. And I would tell you to ask yourself the question, are the people, places, and things, is your environment impacting your ability to stand firm and endure in your faith? We need to examine who we're following and who is leading us. Is it God or is it Fifty Shades of Naughty? Do we know more about Bruce Jenner than we do about Jesus? Are we learning more from Pinterest or from Paul? Who's got the best advice, Dr. Oz or Dr. Luke? Jesus' emphasis in verses 8 and 9 is on alertness. He wanted the disciples and us to keep our eyes open because our environments affect us. They affect our effectiveness and they affect our enjoyment of our purposes. Jesus said, watch out that you're not misled or deceived. Ask yourself, are the people, places, and things in your life helping you or hindering you in your effectiveness and your enjoyment of your purposes? Here's your next set of fill in the blanks. The second step in shifting from worry to peace is to examine our environments. Examine everyone, events and experiences for their effect on your enjoyment and your effectiveness of your purpose. A life free from worry will be peaceful and characterized by people, places, and things that contribute to your effectiveness and also your enjoyment. Secure your safety, Life Coast. Examine your your environment. Watch out for snakes. Jesus' third step for shifting away from worry to peace, from grinding gears to cruise control, is found in verses 12 to 14. Jesus says, but... Before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison. And you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me, but make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. Even after examining the equipment and putting on your seatbelt, there's still some shifting that needs to happen. We need to adjust the angle of the mirrors. We need to adjust the height of the steering wheel. We need to adjust the seat position. We need to adjust the angles of some of the equipment in the car. If we don't make these adjustments, our abilities would be impaired, wouldn't they? Jesus is implying the same thing to his disciples. Worrying doesn't improve your abilities. In fact, worrying only makes your issues, your events, worse. Worrying is like adjusting the mirror so you can't see. Worrying is like adjusting your seat in your wheel so that you have to work harder than smarter. You're basically just setting yourself up for an accident. Worrying also provides the evil one with avenues to attack. You see, worrying is just the gateway. It opens the door to depression, anxiety, fear, gossip, gluttony, sloth, greed, envy, and a whole host of habits and hang-ups. Worrying doesn't help. It gives the enemy avenues to attack, and it only impairs our abilities. The author and pastor Leon Brown says, it all begins and ends in your mind. What you give power to has power over you, if you allow it. Jesus says, since worrying will only make it worse, make up your mind not to worry beforehand. Not because it's going to prevent the issues, the events, or the situations from happening, but because it can only make the issue, event, or situation worse. Adjusting our attitude by making up our minds to not worry is like making a U-turn that gets us off of worry way and onto peace street. Adjusting our attitude by making our minds up to not worry is like making a U-turn that gets us off of worry way 
and onto Peace Street. Fill in your blanks with me. Adjust our attitude in advance to not worry so we don't allow the enemy avenues to attack and impair our abilities. I made a change there from what was originally submitted. Seatbelt, watch out for snakes, U-turn. Secure your safety, examine your environments, and adjust your attitude. The fourth step from shifting from worry to peace is found in the very next verse. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. Not only is Jesus trying to get the disciples to change their attitude towards worry, he is also trying to change their way of thinking. He's trying to shift them closer to him. He's trying to transform their trust. Who remembers navigation before GPS? Henry. How did we ever get anywhere? Who remembers one of these? Kids, this is called a map. And your mother would try to read this in the passenger seat while your dad would drive around aimlessly and refuse to ask directions. You almost weren't born because of the fights that these created. Technology has totally transformed transportation, hasn't it? Jesus is trying to get the disciples in us to trust him and not our own abilities. I love what Francis Chan says about worry. He says, worry implies that we don't trust God. We don't trust that God is big enough, powerful enough, or loving enough to take care of what's happening in our lives. You know what happens when we rely on our own abilities in times of worry? You know what happens when we stay connected to or tuned into our own abilities in times of crisis, stuff blows up. Just like in blasting zones where the wrong person is sending the signals, if you're not familiar with that sign, they encourage you to turn off your two-way radio, they encourage you to turn off your cell phone because you could accidentally send the signal that caused the blasts. When we rely on our own abilities in times of crisis, I don't know about you, but stuff blows up. Instead of worrying about our issues, events, and accidents, Jesus wants us to turn off our own abilities and tune into his. If adjusting our attitude to not worry keeps Satan from impairing our abilities, then transforming our trust to tune into Jesus's keeps us from impairing his abilities. I'm going to say that one more time. If adjusting our attitude to not worry keeps Satan from impairing our abilities, then transforming our trust to tune into Jesus's keeps us from impairing his abilities. Step three keeps Satan from impairing us, and step four keeps us from impairing him. When we make up our minds not to worry, but instead we trust God, we allow God and his almighty abilities to act in our issues, events, and accidents. Jesus said, make up your mind not to worry beforehand, for I will give you words and wisdom. He says, for I will give you. Psalm 37.5 says, commit everything you do to the Lord, trust him, and he will help you. Our God is the God of I will. Our God is the God of I will. Jesus tells us, he says, this is what, what Jesus is saying. He says, don't worry about the earthquakes, famines, and pestilences. I will calm the storm. I will feed you. I will heal you. He's saying, don't worry if they seize you and persecute you. I will free you, and I will redeem you. He's saying, don't worry if family and friends betray you and hate you. I will be faithful, and I will love you. Our God is the God of I will. Somebody here needs to receive that promise today. Jesus is saying, Derek, don't worry. 
1 Corinthians 1.30 says, I will give you wisdom. Jesus is saying, Robert, don't worry, because Matthew 8.7, I said, I will heal you. Brian, Luke 21.14, Jesus says, I will give you words. Sean, Proverbs 3, 5, I will direct your steps. Gail, Philippians 4, 19, I will supply your needs. Life Coast, Isaiah 41, 13, I will help you. Someone here needs to hear Hebrews 13, 5, that says, I will never leave you or forsake you. He says, I will. He says, I will. He says, I will. He says, I will. Over and over and over again, he says, I will. Our God is the God of I wills. Turn to your neighbor and say, our God is the God of I wills. I love when you guys do that. Grab your pens, fill in your blanks. The fourth step in shifting from worry to peace is to transform our trust by turning off the world and tuning in to him to allow the almighty the ability to act in our issues, events, and accidents. Secure safety, examine environments, adjust attitude, transform trust. The fifth and final step in shifting from worry to peace, from a life of grinding our gears to a life of cruise control is found in verse 36. It says, but stay alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that must happen and to stand before the Son of Man. This is truly where the rubber meets the road. How many are familiar with the expression power steering? Has anybody here ever driven a car without power steering? Yeah, crazy hard. Nah, who would do that? I don't even think you can buy a car without power steering anymore, but why would you? But you know what? That's what many of us do in our lives today. We attempt to drive our daily routes without power steering. We all need to switch to power steering. And Jesus is telling his disciples just that in verse 36. He doesn't say, pray that you may escape all the issues, events, and accidents. He says, pray for the strength to avoid the bad stuff. He's telling us we need to switch our supplications. Supplications is how when you approach in prayer and ask, we need to switch our supplications. He's saying to switch from praying that he remove all the issues Instead, we need to be praying for the strength to avoid them. And the only strength, the only strength that can do that is his strength. We need to pray for power steering, his steering. Switching our supplications completes the process of submitting and surrendering the wheel to Jesus. That's how we become a high occupancy vehicle. Because you don't get a more high occupancy vehicle than having the most high in your vehicle. That's your last fill in the blank. Step five, the final step in shifting from grinding our gears to cruise control is to switch our supplications so we have Christ's strength in us to submit and surrender the wheel to the most high. Jesus' five steps involve securing, examining, adjusting, transforming, and switching. These are all verbs of change. They're all verbs of shifting. When we secure our safety like securing our seatbelts by standing firm in our faith, we shift our security. When we examine our environments like examining equipment on a car by keeping our eyes and ears open, we shift our environment. When we adjust our attitudes, like adjusting the angles in our car, by making up our minds in advance not to worry, we shift our attitude. When we transform our trust, like transforming the technology in our vehicles by turning off the world and tuning into God, we shift our trust. And when we switch our supplications, like switching to power steering, by praying for his strength, we shift our supplication. This is how we shift seats. Having Jesus steer your path is true cruise control, amen? Sitting in the passenger seat while Jesus drives, that's peaceful. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then 
you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts. Jesus' steps say that if we stand firm in our faith with strength and endurance by keeping our eyes open for deception and by making up our minds in advance to trust in the Most High, then we can avoid the, avoid the effects of worry. We can, have a, we can win life, eternal life, a peaceful life. This is how we shift from grinding our gears to cruise control. Our God, the God of I wills, the most high, can shift dark to light and black to white, and he can shift worry to peace. He can shift worry to peace. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. Peace at all times. That's what he's offering us. That's what he's offering to you today. Peace at all times. In verse 9, Jesus says, And when you hear of wars and rebellions, do not be afraid, for these things must happen. There must be issues, events, and accidents. He never says, believe in me, and your life will be trouble-free. In fact, in John 16, he says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus is saying, believe in me, keep your eyes on me, trust in me, pray to me, and I will give you the strength to have peace at all times. In the middle of your events, in the middle of your issues, in the middle of all your situations, you can have peace at all times because I am in control. I have the wheel. Someone needs to receive this promise today. Somebody here has worry. And if you're ready to shift seats today, I want to encourage you during our last song of worship, I want you to come to the cross. I want you to symbolically take that worry and nail it to the cross. Give it to the God of I will. Give it to the Most High. Give it to the one who gives peace. Come to the cross in enduring faith with eyes on him, making up your mind not to worry about it anymore. Trusting in him to give you the strength that you're going to need if you pray for it. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you. We thank you for giving us your son. We thank you for your words, your gift of do's and your list of I wills. It is our supplication today that you would give us the strength to secure safety. You would give us the strength to examine our environment. You would give us the strength to adjust our attitude. And you would give us the strength to transform our trust to you. Lord, bless us and keep us. Let your face shine on us and give us peace. In your son's mighty name, amen and amen.